It's another episode of the RSL Random Fan Podcast, and we're doing a little follow-up on um, my other favorite team, Crawley Town. I'm joined today by Gary Smith, and a new new person is joining us, Tony Vesey, who helps out Gary on the broadcast at home, right, and also helped at Wembley. So how are you guys doing this morning? Yeah, yeah great, doing uh, really well. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, really good. Nice and windy here as usual. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's not June weather over here in the UK at the moment. And looking out the window, it's, yeah, wet and, and miserable and sort of as you expect the British summer to be, I guess. <laughs> oh, that sounds perfect. It's going to be like 100 degrees here in, uh, <laughs> in Salt Lake. It's it's way too hot. But we have a new guest, Tony Vesey, and he is an actual Brawley Town legend, if I, if I understand it correctly. Is that right? <laughs> Far be it for me to say. Brad, it's for other people to say, but I played the odd game or two, just put it that way. <laughs> if I remember right, it's like 400 games for Crowley, or how many yeah, games? 432, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who's asking, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Crowley Town is, uh, is a big part of your life, or at least uh, uh, deeply in your heart. So what were your what were your thoughts on this season, Tony? We've talked to Gary about this, but before we get too far into this, I wonder what your thoughts were on this season for Crawley compared to maybe some recent ones? Well, it's been, you know, what a difference from, from last season when we were, you know, battling against relegation, just escaped it. And then through the, the off season last year, we were all wondering where the big signings were coming from. And then all these unknown names started coming through the door and you look at the fans forum and everybody's a bit, wary and scared of what the season might might bring um but i think the even in the first pre-season when i think gary and i were there when we played crystal palace you could see the work that had been done on the training ground and the ability of the the players that had come in and and as the season progressed you know we were always going to be i thought we were going to be nice and comfortably mid-table um as the season went on and then we just had that incredible run from february onwards and then of course we had to make it scary for ourselves by losing the last four games before the final game to to see where we we're going to make the playoffs so um you know it, it i don't think anybody outside of of the staff expected us to be where we were and it was just a superb achievement yeah, it was and I think I asked Gary this question and like, what was the turning point or when is there a particular game that maybe you thought, wow, this could be a, an interesting season. We might actually make a run to the playoffs. I think it was when, when that, that game, uh, we beat Mansfield away uh, and, and then Newport away, I think just before that too, you know, by four goals, we scored four times away from home in both games. You then thought, yeah, we've we've got a real chance now to beat somebody like Mansfield that comprehensively on their own turf, as it were. Um, at that point, you think, yeah, we've got we've got a real chance now. And I, you know, looking at it, I think tactically, you know, I, I made no uh, bones that I've been quite a fan of Clady Lolos since he he came. Um, and wasn't playing often enough for me. And then he started to play regularly and then he started to play. Uh, Scott made him play a bit further forward, almost alongside Orsi. And I think that that was a game changer for us as well, tactically. So, um, you know, credit to the manager, you know, the, for making that change and, and for what he's done all season, really. It's been an amazing turnaround and, and you can see the effort and the work that's gone in day in, day out by the pattern and the way we play. If I remember, I remember right, Gary, you mentioned the the Bradford comeback game as maybe 
a turning point where uh, you still believe that? Yeah, it's funny, actually, Brad, because uh, in the build up to Wembley, Tony and I were, were both asked to, to pick out maybe three or four sort of pivotal games um, that, that we thought had sort of forced the run into the playoffs. So Bradford was was one of the ones that I mentioned, as well as the Manfield game that, that Tony was just talking about. But I also thought the, and hopefully Tony will agree with this as well, the game at home against Notts County. Uh, Notts County, you know, big yeah. club tipped by many this season to do, you know, very big things along with Wrexham and everything coming out of the National League. And they were expected to go straight through League Two, you know, just like Wrexham did. And Crawley fell behind in that game. And when they came back to win that 2-1 with, I think, without Yamo, you know, smashing home the winner, um, you just sort of, and I, I sort of seem to remember saying to Tony, you know, at the final whistle, you, you just sort of thought that if they could hit form at the right time and grind out that sort of result, then they really had a great chance. And the other game that I picked out was obviously, like I say, the Manfield game and also that game on the final day of the season against Grimsby because Crawley had to do their bit and obviously hope that results went their way elsewhere as well, which obviously they did. And, you know, I, it was just a great atmosphere against Grimsby on that day. And, and Crawley were, you know, the nerves could have easily kicked in, um, but they got the job done. They were professional and they were two goals up by the break. And I thought that was, a, a you know, obviously a very, very important game as well because it it cemented the place in the playoffs. And then, you know, everything just got better from from there on in. Yeah, and we've kind of talked about this through the season, and uh, I talk about it a lot, and I could probably talk about it, <laughs> continue to keep talking about the season that Crawley had. But uh, let's uh, share your experience going to Wembley. We talked to Gary before Wembley and and uh, how Crawley kind of just dismantled MK Dons. Uh, but Tony, as a as a, a legend of Crawley and being around the team forever, what what was it like to, for your first experience going to Wembley and watching Crawley play as a fan and as a part of the team? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to describe, you know, being alongside Gary and you know, being around the press room and the atmosphere, being there early with no one really in the ground. And then seeing the fans coming and the atmosphere start, start and continue to build up until kickoff, you know, seeing the players coming out and warming up, it was, it was just that gradual, you know, trying to find the right words, just a gradual expectation coming up to kickoff as to what the game was going to behold and the what the atmosphere was was going to be like. Um, all BBC people there doing the stuff pre-match. Uh, live on the radio, being live on the radio, um, it was it was just a great experience. You know, I, I had a few playing in a Crawley shirt. We've had a, I've had a few commentating over the years, but you know, obviously being at Wembley is is a pinnacle and, and will be very difficult to beat. And and then after the game, you know, the game was great, fully deserved to win. We're far the better side than Crew. On the day, and then going down with Gary and seeing him do the interviews and and all that stuff that that happens after the game that I normally don't really get involved with, um, you know, speaking to the players and the manager, it was uh, a whole new experience and and one you know I'll, I'll never forget. Well, a question for both of you: Is it uh, the thought process with fans that you would much rather? go through the process of the playoffs and, and end up at Wembley and have that experience over just getting promoted, which Crawley's done a couple of times out of the national league into, into out of the league two and into league one previously, they didn't go through the playoff process. They, they just won outright and were promoted outright is do fan would fans rather have the Wembley experience if they had the choice between the two? I think that all depends on whether you win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day. Uh, uh, and I think that's the bottom line is, you know, it's a fantastic experience. If you come away, you get a trophy um, and you're then in League One, wouldn't want to be in Crew's shoes um, or MK Dons for that matter. So um, I think from a, a player's point of view, 
you'd want to get it much as you'd love to play at Wembley and it's it's a pinnacle of a player's career you wouldn't want that jeopardy I don't think being in their shoes you'd want to get it done over the 46 games but you know you can't beat that experience it's it's such a balance isn't it which one would you choose uh, but I think from a, a club and a player point of view much as you'd love to go to Wembley you'd want to be sure you were you were up it's funny Brant as well because I was talking to my father-in-law about things and, and he said and he's right really um Obviously, Stockport got a trophy for being the League Two champions. Wrexham and Mansfield went up but didn't receive anything apart from the, the joy of automatic promotion. Crawley winning the playoffs, get themselves a trophy, and they could do the, the celebration party the next night at the Broadfield Stadium. And, yeah, Wrexham and Mansfield could have easily done a, a thing back at their own grounds, but th they wouldn't have had a trophy to display. <laughs> at least yeah. Crawley, you know, having having won the playoffs, and like Tony rightly says, it, it's great to be in the playoffs, but you've only got a 25% a chance of winning of the four teams that are in there. And, you know, if you get to Wembley, that's a great achievement. If you then lose at Wembley, like Scott has said all along, Wembley's not a great place to be if you don't come away with the trophy no. or you don't come away with the result. It's a great experience for Tony and I, and it would have been heartbreaking if we'd lost, but we wouldn't have felt it maybe as much as the players would have done who put in all that effort over the 46 league games and then the, the two record-breaking playoff semi-finals, it, it would have been an absolute heartbreak. So, you know, like Tony was just saying, the fans obviously now, you know, first time in the playoffs, big fans obviously of the playoff system. And it's a, it, it's a great thing to be a fan of if your side has won it. And like Tony said, crew, you know, one game away from promotion, suddenly in August have to start all over again with game number one out of, out of 46 um, and you just you know quite a lot of seasons you look at the side that lost in the playoff final have a little bit of a in any division have a little bit of a hangover the following season and don't perform as well as they did the previous season you know they lose, I've already seen that crew have, have lost a couple of players the MK Dons have, have made a couple of signings including I think one player from crew and obviously one player who was on loan with Crawley last season um, they're obviously aiming you know, big time for this season. But there, there will be, I think, a little bit of a hangover for, for some of the sides that, that didn't win the playoffs. But I guess we don't have to worry about that too much, do we? Because we did win the playoffs. <laughs> so, we, we, you know, if we're going to get a hangover, it's, it's going to be in League One. And, and that was the ultimate aim. So how has this whole experience, or has it changed, the, the fandom surrounding Brawley Town? It's a small club. But uh, what are your thoughts? Will this make a big difference, make a, a difference at all, moving into League One and having such a great end of the season? Uh, I think it'll it'll have a, an impact initially. And then, as with everything, it all revolves around results and, and performances on the pitch. So, yeah, we've, we've got a core fan base and that core fan base has, has increased in the last couple of years. Um, from from this season, from the way that we've played, and also with the owners, you know, controlling season ticket prices. Uh, so we've got that core. Whether any of those, uh, the, the extras that go to, there's always the, you see the terminology, the Johnny come lately fans, and all those the kind of terminology of those that just go to the big games and don't really stick around. Which every every club's the same. Um, just just how many of those will will come back and then how long they'll come back for will depend on what they see on the on the park each week i think yeah, that sounds like a a very uh, utah or american <laughs> answer because we have the same issue here if you're if you're not winning it's really hard for fans to come out and just enjoy the game but i'm glad to see that it's not just limited to our side of the pond, but hopefully that uh, with what Carly experienced this year, we'll have more, more fans in the stadium. So what are your thoughts on your predictions for Crawley town moving forward in league one? Well, <laughs> well you see, I think, <laughs> I think uh, 
quite a lot of it depends on the personnel that come and go over the course of the summer. Um, obviously, there was the details of, you know, contract extensions, uh, who'd been offered a contract extension, who'd been released, et cetera, et cetera. We know that, you know, Lawrence Maguire's not coming in as a, a permanent signing. He's gone off to the MK Dons. We know that of the names of people that, that were leaving, Harry Ransom, I'm not going to say came as a huge surprise, but I think he was the... He had been part of the first team squad. He was on the bench at Wembley. I think all the other players that were allowed to go hadn't really been involved too much over the course of the season. Mm. Um, I think Crawley will start as they did this season, as a lot of people's favourites to go down when you look at the makeup of, of League One. But I also think that that's the sort of challenge that, that Scott relishes. Um, he likes to sort of go under the radar just a wee bit, you know, and a, a couple of times. That, Tony hopefully remembers that when we spoke to him, Tony, after the game against Grimsby that secured the playoff spot, he said, I want to dedicate this to everybody who wrote us off at the start of the yeah. season and, you know, said that we had no chance of, of survival, never mind finishing mid-table, never mind getting the playoffs. So I think I think there's, there's a lot of ifs and buts. You know, it, it, like I say, it depends on the, on the personnel that are still around. Um, it depends on... Sometimes it, it depends on how the fixtures pan out as well, because Tony and I spoke uh, before the start of last season and, and and it was Bradford at home, Salford away. I think Wrexham were in their early doors as well as one of the games. Gillingham were in there. That was going to be a bit of a local derby, you know, being a, a team that Scott had played for and they had, you know, obviously two or three former Crawley players. Uh, so I think a lot of it also depends on those first half a dozen fixtures when the fixtures are released to look at them and think, you know, yeah, we could take points there and we could take points there. But there's some big teams in League One, Brad. There's some there's some big sides in there. You look at the sides that, that came out of the championship, you know, Birmingham City, Huddersfield, you know, the likes of Bolton are still in there because obviously they lost their playoff final. Wigan are in there, former Premier League side and a former FA Barnsley. Cup winner. Barnsley, Reading, Charlton, you know, as well as Crawley renewing some acquaintances with the likes of, you know, Stevenage, Exeter, Leighton Orient, Peterborough again, because obviously they lost in the playoffs and they beat Crawley in the, the Bristol Street Motors trophy last season. It's gonna be it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough. But as a as a manager, you know, like Scott and as a player, these are the challenges you want, aren't they? You want to pit yourself against better sides all, all the time that you can. You know, as a player, you want to play at the highest level that you possibly can. As a manager, you want to manage at the highest level you possibly can. As a commentator and a co-commentator, you want to be commentating on, you know, the highest level that you possibly can for that side that you commentate on. Yeah. My first my first year co-commentating was the year we got relegated from League One back to, to League Two. And, I mean, we were in pit dire straits at that time and it was actually a miracle we were still in with a shout on the last game of the season of staying up because come Christmas New Year we were dead and buried in in my opinion and Dean Saunders came in and uh, and resurrected us and just made us very difficult to beat and, and we just went down on the last day which obviously is completely opposite to what we've we've just experienced I, I it's like you say, Gary, it's going to be a tough season. It's going to be dependent on, you know, there's rumours about who's coming, who's going, and they'll go on until the first ball is kicked or the, the transfer window closes. And only at that point will you have a reasonable shout as to what you think your chances might be. I know, you know, we must know from the way the manager is that he'll have our expectations regardless of what squad is put together and he won't be looking at, well, I'm just here to avoid relegation. As I think as Gary was saying, I'm here to to finish as high as I possibly can. And, you know, that's if that's playoffs, that's playoffs. Probably a big challenge for us, I would suggest at this point. But um, it's, as you say, it's far too early to say we've got contract negotiations going on. Or see rumoured to be offers for him, the manager possibly offers for him, 
who knows where we're going to be <laughs> come the first game at the beginning of August, I guess. So I'm going to sit on the fence for this one, uh, Brant, at this point. Um, it's a little early. I think we'll survive, um, but I think it's going to be tough. Now, you mentioned offers for Scott because I wanted to – had a question, couple of questions about Scott and his style of play. Do you – hopefully we retain him, right? Do you think there's any danger of losing Scott Lindsay in the uh, – between now and the start of the season? Or is he committed to – uh, the opportunity to grow this club. It's uh, he's he's bound he's bound to get noticed because sure. of you know the TV coverage of the three playoff games and the style of play and and the way that we won and, and destroyed MK Dons is bound to get him noticed and his name's going to come up in various conversations. Um, whether. And it will just depend on what kind of, if any offers come in and from what type of clubs. If it's if it was somebody like Bolton, a big league one side, probably find it difficult to turn them down or a championship club. If it's, uh, if it was, say, that it won't be Stevenage because they've just appointed a manager, but somebody of that ilk, I wouldn't have thought he'd go. He'd, he'd want to, to continue with the project that he's he started with and, and see it through even further. Um, so, again, it's all ifs and buts. It would depend on the, on the size and the, and the type of club that came in for him, if they do, and then he'd have a difficult choice to make. But, you know, sometimes there are offers you just can't turn down. Any thoughts on that, Gary? Well, I agree with what Tony says, and it was it's interesting, really, Brant, because two days after the promotion was secured at Wembley, um, Scott's name was being linked with the, the vacant manager's job at Birmingham City. Um, uh, you know, and like Tony says, it, it, because of what he's achieved, you know, after being everybody's favourites to go down, he's he is bound to get noticed, as are some of the players. You know, 25 goals a season in for, for Orsi in, in any standard of football, be that Premier League, Championship, League One, League Two, National League, Sunday League, 25 goals in a season is a, a fantastic achievement. Yeah. Um, so there's bound to be notice of him as well. And that is obviously testament to the, you know, the recruitment and everything that Scott has done to develop, you know, uh, with the coaching staff to develop Orsi into the player that we've seen this season. Um, I think like Tony says, you know, that when he was linked with the, the Birmingham City job, Scott, it, it, they're a side that are in the same division now. So the only sway of going to Birmingham for Scott would be a bigger wage budget, maybe a bigger transfer budget to use on players, a bigger wage budget to spend, you know, with the players. Um, but you've also got to think, I, I think as well, you know, Birmingham City's expectations this season will be that they go straight back to the championship. Crawley's expectations will probably be, uh, and I don't mean it horribly, Crawley's expectations will be slightly less. So if Scott were to go, and um, and he's not because I think Birmingham have announced somebody now, but that's just using that yeah. as an example. Sure. Um, if Birmingham weren't where they wanted to be, come sort of Christmas time, that manager could easily be out of a job. Do you know what I mean? And then all the work that Scott's put in at Crawley, he, he, he hasn't got a job to work with. So I I think I I agree with Tony, and I've said this to people before. I think knowing Scott as I do, you know, speaking to him after every game. I think he would want to stay and and see the job through and continue the momentum of what he's achieved this season. Yeah, and then there's always a danger to jump. And I think of Rob Edwards, who ended up in a good spot, but he uh, um, had Forrest Green uh, just just smoking through League Two, and then they get promoted, and he ends up going to Watford, and they they had him around for like ten days, and yeah. then. Uh, Said, see you later, but he he fe he landed on his feet at Luton Town and has had a nice run there. So there's there's obviously no guarantees. Um, the grass isn't always greener on the other side, as they say. No, yeah. but uh, what about your thoughts on players? Do you have any favorite players during this season? And uh, there's probably some that obviously won't be in League One with us, but any thoughts on players that stood out this season? And then uh, maybe a follow-up 
Who do you think would have an impact in League One? Well, Tony's already mentioned that he was a big fan of uh, of Clyde Lolos, and he made he made like he said he made no secret of that uh, during the course of the commentaries this season. I think obviously Orsi's a you know a huge name, uh, and I think Tony and I mentioned you know in the last couple of games and into the playoffs that. When you looked at the the substitutes bench this towards the, the final games of the season, there were players there that would probably walk into the starting eleven of of any other side in League Two. You know, Nick Sarula wasn't a name that you could see being left out of the starting eleven at the start of the season. Um, you know, there's and I suppose it's those sort of players in and around the fringes of the first team who you've maybe got to have a closer look at as to whether they'll be around next season because if they you know, if other players start to come in and the likes of of Nick Sarula, you know, Ronan Darcy, Harry Ransom, as we talked about, you know, has already been released by the club. And, you know, if, if offers come in for, for those sort of players, then they're the sort of players who I think Crawley could be losing. You know, Orsi said to me after the Grimsby game, um, if, if the gaffer stays, Gary, I'll stay. Um, obviously now going into League One, you hope that Scott is going to stay. Obviously, we all hope that Orsi stays because, yes, there, there were rumours. I don't know whether you saw a couple of weeks ago or earlier this week that he was being linked with Stockport County. Mm. Um, again, oh, really? a side that are going to be in the same division next season, having won League Two. Um, you know, would he would he be as much of an influential player if he went somewhere like Stockport? Would he just sort of be making up the numbers in terms of just being a squad player and being, you know, rotated around, would he be first choice? Whereas I think for Orsi, if he stays at Crawley, and, you know, Tony will hopefully agree, if he stays at Crawley, he is, you know, one of the first names on the team sheet, isn't he? For next season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he, he became that focal point, particularly, you know, throughout the last few games of the season. Um, you know, I, you know, again, I was a little bit critical of him around the Christmas yeah. time that his actual centre foot, true centre forward play of holding the ball up uh, and, and his first touch wasn't as good as I thought it should have been. And then he ran the words down my throat in the last <laughs> half a dozen, 10 games to, to, to completely shut me up. So, um, you know, fair play to him. He, he and, and again, at the the work that's done on the training ground, the way we've we've played, and the number of times he's just tapped one in from six yards out because we've got him behind the full backs, the crosses have come in, and he's just right place, right time. And that's that's just work on the training ground day in, day out, uh, which is which has helped him, I think, enormously in in his goal ratio, certainly. I'll tell you two other players as well, Brian, who really stood out for me this season. The first one was just incredible at the start of the season and incredible at the end of the season. He had an injury and tailed off a little bit in mid-season. That was Liam Kelly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was fantastic in the first few games of the season and we all sort of looked around and thought, blimey, who's this lad we've signed? Like He's absolutely incredible. He was controlling everything, picking up the ball from the defensive three and sort of, you know, working it through the thirds in the way that Scott likes to play. Then he got that injury and when he came back, his form wasn't as good as it had been. But then obviously he really came good again, didn't he? You know, towards the end of the season. Yeah. Scored in the game at home against MK Dons. Scored at Wembley. I think he got mad of the match awards for both the semi-finals and the final, didn't he? Yeah. And I don't think there's too many players in playoff history that have got the man of the match awards for, for all three of the games, you know, both semi-finals and the final. Um, so he was incredible. And the other player that, that really stood out for me, who I thought was was really consistent this season in terms of not just his defending, but everything he contributed to the side was Will Wright. Hmm. I thought Will Wright had a, a phenomenal season and he would be one player that I would really want to hold on to over the summer going into next season. Because if we've now lost Lawrence Maguire, if Wright and Conroy are still going to play as two of the defensive three, then it's just who you bring in to play on the left side. Um and it could be that Scott has got something up his sleeve already about somebody who's coming in. But then we've also got the likes of, of Joy McKenna, who came in and deputised for Wright yeah. 
and Maguire and Conroy throughout different stages of the season and I never looked out of place. And I think we also uh, have to give an honourable mention this season to Jay Williams, who, uh, you know, gets himself into a little bit of bother sometimes by, you know, the aggressive nature of the, the way that he plays the game. But that's obviously just how he does play the game. But I think also underneath all that, there's a, a very, very good, intelligent footballer there. And I think the yeah, only but... thing that, that that Jay might talk about this season that he, he he not let himself down on, but he would like to improve on, I think, is his goal scoring. I think he only ended up with three during the course of the season, um, yeah. but they were they were three very important ones. He got one at Tranmere, he got one in the home at, get, uh, the home game against the Dons, didn't he? And got one away as well, yeah, set the ball well, rolling yeah. with that first goal, didn't he, at, at Stadium MK, which obviously at the time then put us. 4 nil up on aggregate and you, you you couldn't then foresee what was going to happen for the remaining yeah. 87 minutes of that one. So, yeah. yeah, they're three players that I would pick out. Yeah, I think there's been some work. They've done some work with Jay Williams through the season as well because if he was like he was at the beginning of the season when Dean stamped on him at the away leg, the MK Dons, he would have just... <laughs> yeah. you'd have gone then you'd have absolutely yeah. gone and it, you, you're just trying to restrain him and, but obviously they've worked on his temperament uh, through the season uh, and you know he's he's managed to, to curtail his his uh, wide his, his madder self should we say yeah two players that uh, I was drawn to Corey Adai I thought he improved um, on the season and they must have done a ton of work and I think all the all the skill and talent is there, and it's all just up here in uh, yeah. Corey's ability to uh, figure out how he can influence the games. And once he figures that out, he's going to be amazing. And then I also, uh, as an American, Jeremy Kelly, yeah, uh, the surprise that he was. Hopefully, he sticks around. I know that uh, we we chatted with uh, um, Preston Johnson. A little while ago, we'll have that. We'll be releasing that interview, and he was, you know, sharing some info on finding players. I didn't know that Jeremy actually has a, a British citizen or citizenship there, and uh, spent mm -hmm. some time there in his uh, uh, early years. I think six years as, as a kid. So, but I was uh, really excited to see his play, and I was really felt a little bad because I'm a Nick Sarula fan too. I thought that uh, Jeremy came in and gave a little bit more of what Scott was looking for and kind of forced Nick to the bench uh, for a little bit. <clears throat> so let me ask you this. Uh, we don't have the budget that, uh, say, a Wrexham does. Uh, Preston was uh, saying that uh, Wrexham can probably spend up to like $10 million in wages with the system over there. I don't think Crawley's close to that <laughs> in spending, <laughs> being able to spend that kind of funds. Um, do you think the budget will have a negative effect on the on the play on the how the season League One goes, or um, any thoughts on that? It's I think budget makes a difference. You know, whatever, however well we've done on a, on a minimal budget this season, um, it's probably the the rare thing that proves the rule that budget does make a difference. Don't think there's any any question on that. Um, you know, the three the automatics, you know, would have decent budgets without question. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be looking for those gems, some more gems like we found at the beginning of of, of this season. I, I don't think it'll be any any different, maybe a little bit more up the National League or, or League Two players, you know, there's still going to be plenty of players that are looking for clubs who who might not get them, who've got a bit of experience that we might be able to pick up quite cheaply, but, you know, we won't be paying out thousands and thousands a week like uh, like the likes of Wrexham. And it, it, it will be a constraint, I think that's for sure. And is there any backlash? We kind of talked about it um, from fans in England, uh, in League Two, League One, over the success of 
Wrexham and how they've gone about doing their business. It's it's something to behold for sure, but is it kind of like uh, uh, the Man City where nobody's a Man City fan unless they're from yeah. Manchester, it seems like. Or the, uh, the Yankees or the Lakers, uh, different teams over here. Nobody likes the, the team that wins all the time. No, I mean that was us in the when we won the National League. We were the we were quoted as the Man City of the National League because of the money that we had and the budget that we had. And you know, we went on and won by a record number of points at that point, I think. Uh so yeah, it's it there does come with angst from the other the other teams in the league that perhaps haven't got that that level of money to spend. Um but sometimes what goes around comes around and and again, like with us, money comes, money goes, and then you're in a different a different uh, a different pool of teams scratching around for for players. So it, it all comes in cycles. Manchester City are, are probably the exception to the rule, but um certainly down in League One, League Two, you'll have a, a quick rise with plenty of money and then unless that money sticks around, it can sometimes disappear as quick as it, it came. But yeah, there, oh, is, just, there is the envy, certainly. I'll just chip in as well, Brian, and say it doesn't, the money doesn't always buy success. You've got no. to, you've got to get the right players in and the manager has got to, you can't just go out and buy 11 players and send them out on a Saturday afternoon and hope that everything's going to gel. Uh, and I think Crawley are, a living proof of that. Like Tony says, the three teams that went up, Stockport, Wrexham, Mansfield, big budgets, uh, big wage budgets, big spending budgets. Crawley didn't have that and have, have gone through into League One as well with a, a much smaller budget because of the recruitment process that Crawley have in place to find these, you know, who'd heard of Clyde Lolos this time last year? Who'd heard of Jay Williams, you know, unearthing these sort of players and a lot of a lot of what Crawley do is now very data-driven. Um, I know Scott spends a lot of time looking at data that his, his scouts, you know, they, they they fit a certain criteria. And he's, he said many times, Orsi was a good signing because his times that he arrived in the box and his XG that Scott talks about a lot uh, was great. And it was just sort of, you know, like Tony said earlier, harnessing that that ability that he clearly had to you know, getting his body shape right and arrival time in the box and being in the right place at the right time. The money, the money can't always buy that that sort of thing. It, it you know, you can go out and spend 40, 50 million pounds on a player, let's say, in, in the Premier League. It's not going to be a guarantee that that player is going to fit automatically into the, the system that the manager wants to play. Yeah, and as we go into League One, the, this is my my thought, and tell me where if I'm on or off, or if you agree or disagree, I think Crawley goes the way that Scott Lindsay goes. I think the way the club is built, this the style of play, which is a little more, I don't know what the word, progressive, or it's a little more, it's fun to watch, um, than regular League Two, maybe. Maybe League One has a different style that, uh, teams will play a lot like we do, but I, I don't know that to be the case. But I love the way that the team is uh, greater than the sum of its parts, which mm. is always fantastic and just makes for fantastic stories. But it also means that if one piece of that, like, say, Scott Lindsay uh, leaves, it's so hard to keep that core together and that thought process, that team playing to get together in a way that doesn't just completely fall apart. Um, so I think maybe a good question would be how much of the success is Scott Lindsay and how much, if we lose Scott, a coach like Scott Lindsay, does that, uh, what are the odds of continuing on this style of play or would a new manager come in and do something different? Kind of a I'll, let, I'll, let, I'll let Tony... I'll let Tony go for that one first because he's <laughs> he's been in that managerial chair. <laughs> yeah, not for long, but um, <laughs> I think it it all revolves around the manager who's in charge at the time, and and what the style of play they want to play and the players 
they bring in to fit that style. Uh, so if the manager goes, then at League One and League Two, if you're in the Premier League, they all play the same way, pretty much. So th there's not going to be much change. A few tweaks. I mean, De Zerbi came in at Brighton and and played a slightly different way, albeit a different take on that possession-based game. Um, League One, League Two is a bit different. You'll get the more physical aspect of it, more direct with some teams. Um, and it would all depend on if he go, if he went, which clearly we don't want, then it would all depend who, who would replace him. I think it would be very difficult to replicate the style that he's instilled and, and worked so hard to, to get into the team. But I think that style, even with the, the core of the squad we've we've got, the, the players that hopefully are, are going to stay with one or two additions, would probably survive quite well in League One because if you keep the ball most of the time, then the other team can't score and you've got more chance of scoring. And that's, again, that's all around that possession-based, uh, sorry, stats-based way of, of doing things, how long you've got the ball, how many passes you make, how many runs you make. I've, I've seen a scouting system that a, a friend of mine's got that he does, he does work for a championship club. And the amount of information and data that they've got at their fingertips just blows your mind. You can watch a Nigerian second division player that played on Saturday if you want, and all the stats will be there, and how many runs he made, how many passes he made. It's the the, the background work is just is is a world away from from my old days uh, of a some black guy with a cigarette and his dog watching a player on a Sunday afternoon in the park. Um, so. Yeah, it, it's coming back to that. It all revolves around the manager and the, the way he wants to play. And I think our style of play will suit us in League One if we can keep the core of what we've got and add a bit more and a bit more experience at that level. Over to you, Gary. <laughs> no, I, I I haven't got much more to say, really, because the, the 11 players that go out there are just an extension of the way the manager wants them to play, aren't they? And the work that's gone on, you know, on the training ground every single day in the lead up to that game. And we we know that Scott doesn't have any other way that he wants to play the game. Yeah. It's going to be possession-based. It's going to be knocking it around on the floor. Um, you know, Tony and I have spent, you know, some seasons watching League Two action where the ball has gone from the back to the front very quickly. And you end up sort of driving home with a bit of a sore neck if you spent most of the game watching the ball go <laughs> up in the air from one end of the field to the other. And like this has been an absolute, them, right? yeah, this has been an absolute revelation this season. And I know from asking Scott about things, he he won't play any other way because Scott's answer yeah. about, you know, when fans were saying things earlier in the season about there should be a plan B. And, and Scott's answer was that plan, I have no plan B. Plan B is that plan A should work better. So if plan A is not working, we need to work out why it's not working and, and make it work. <laughs> I've always found that quite funny, the plan, the plan B thing, because nobody's plays, nobody's got a plan B. No. You know, Man City, Man City, Man United, Liverpool, Klopp hasn't got a plan B. Guardiola doesn't have a plan B. All those teams, none of those managers have a plan B. So the plan B phenomenon is is a bit of a misnomer for me you as you say you've got a style of play and if it doesn't work you get beat and then the next week mm. you have to work a bit harder uh, and then you'll win in some games you win some games you won't but that's your style of play and, and that's what it is I think the thing that Scott is very good at is some very minor tactical changes yeah. during the course of a game substitutions wise you know we've said it in commentary tony about somebody coming on keller gordon coming on for example because he'll just be that little bit more defensively minded down the right hand side but we know what he can do going forward tactical changes to move a, uh, you know and he said to me post match before scott i made a couple of tweaks at half time and we moved this player sort of slightly inside 10 yards or further forward 10 yards yeah. and like you say i 
I wouldn't call that a plan B. That's just the adaptation yeah, to the way the game is panning out. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's where we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been great talking to you guys. I really appreciate you giving me some time. And I'll end, end with uh, uh, maybe some predictions for League One and how confident you are. For me personally, uh, and you guys are the experts, but I'll share my thoughts. I, I think <laughs> that if Scott Lindsay sticks around and they continue to play this system, the style of play, they bring in the players that want to play for Scott Lindsay and want to play this way. I don't think Crawley will have any problems staying up in League One. I think it could be a challenge especially if, you know, teams did figure out a little bit and parked a bus on them and they had a hard time breaking stuff down for a little bit, but they figured it out and ended the season strong. But I have just all the faith in the world that Scott Lindsay will be able to keep Crawley Town up next season because of their style of play. And it's, I just love watching them play football and I hope it continues for a few more seasons and a few more leagues. But what are your thoughts, at least promotions, not relegations? But what are your thoughts on next season? I, I, I think, think it's going to be, as you, I agree I agree with you that the way we play, if we can continue to keep the players, the nucleus of the, the team that we've had with a couple of additions, uh, two or three additions, we're going to need defenders clearly because of, of Maguire and, and Ransom going then we've got you know, more than a good chance of, of staying up. The big issue is you've got four teams go down instead of two. Uh, so that's that's one massive difference between where we are mm. and where we've been. Um, so I'll be happy with anywhere from 19th to 12th or 13th. <laughs> For me, will be a, a good season. I know the manager... Would, would tell me off for saying that kind of thing. But uh, anywhere in between those positions, and I'll be delighted. I, I, think we'll, I think we'll win it. I think we'll win League One. <laughs> I think I think then we'll win the Championship. <laughs> I think next year we're, we're going to win League keep One. With the manager. We're going to win League One. We're going to win the FA Cup, the Carabao Cup. Um, a few years' time, we'll be into Europe. Tony and I will have to be getting our passport sorted to go to some European games. Uh, I, I think, it, I agree with what Tony says, uh, keep the manager, the style of play, et cetera, et cetera. Um, top half of the table, top half of League One, quite easily, awesome. is my prediction. Awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough. We'll have to catch up before the season starts, perhaps, after yeah. they've made uh, all the changes, and hopefully uh, we've got some new players. And uh, I know they missed out on killing Mbappe probably just a little bit. You know, <laughs> probably probably <laughs> close, but Real Madrid got killing Mbappe. But thank you both he wouldn't for joining f- us. He wouldn't fit in, Brant, anyway. <laughs> no, oh, yeah. He, he's probably way too selfish. He wouldn't, he wouldn't fit, fit in the system. No. no. <laughs> well, thank you. Nice to t- chat with you both. And thanks for joining Cheers, Brant. No worries. Yeah, See you in League One. Cheers. Take care.